Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we're kicking off the new design workflow, and uh, we're all with phase two, and there's been some significant improvements to the way that we've been doing our workflow when it comes to uh, designing of sites and the design implementation and the front-end development of them as well. Um, so that's some of the stuff that we'd like to share with you. Uh, go ahead and pick and choose from what we share, and hopefully you guys can implement it in some of your projects and can uh, help out and uh, make kind of what you are able to do a little more enjoyable and uh, quicker, hopefully. So my name's Evan, and I'm going to be going over the kind of the process overview and the tooling selection that we use. Um, and then both of these gentlemen are going to dive into more of the specifics. So we've got Joey, um, who's going to be talking a lot about the design process. And we got Micah, who's going to be talking a lot about the front-end development process. So I'm going to give a little overview, and then they'll dive into some details. And uh, we hope it helps you out. So one of the biggest things that has helped us out has been implementation of a prototyping tool, Pattern Lab. So we love Pattern Lab. It's been helping out tons. Uh, who here has heard of Pattern Lab? Who here uses Pattern Lab? Anybody using Pattern Lab on a project right now? Oh, so this is perfect. So we had a lot of hands go up for heard, but not as many go up for am using. So you're at the right spot. So um, Pattern Lab looks a little bit like this. And there's a lot that it can do. And so you know, it, it's, definitely, it's definitely a style guide. Um, and it is definitely. Um, so it also is a prototyping tool and style guide together, basically. And by prototyping, I mean high-fidelity HTML pages, to be specific. So we're not, we're not talking about gray boxes or wireframes. Um, this thing looks like the end product. So as if you, right here, we're kind of in the style guide portion, but you can go to fully, full pages. So we've even been able to have this as a design deliverable that satisfies the client on the end, whether we're talking about design or front-end development. So that's been a big win for us, um, and it's, it's a big component inventory. Uh, ma major props to uh, Brad Frost and Dave Olson. Oops, I killed some slides. Awesome. One second. My apologies. All right. Trying to get the speaker notes all, all, all full screen. Anyway, so major props to Brad Frost and Dave Olson uh, to be able to put this together. So that's an open source project that's out there, and that's all of them. So um, yeah, it's great. So it's just the tool that we like. Um, and I would say that most static site generators would do the trick. So whatever works for you, go with it. Um, if you don't have one you're using, this is a great one. So the, it, it's built on this idea of modular components and kind of these things that stand alone that can be put together to build bigger systems. Um, the vocabulary that is uh, used here is based off of atomic design, which is you don't need to follow atomic design to use Pattern Lab, and you don't need to have Pattern Lab to use atomic design. The two do go very much hand in hand, though. So I have this vocabulary that's kind of biologically based, and it is using atoms, molecules, and organisms. And kind of the idea is that each go into the next. So we've got atoms, which are like our simple labels, and just our individual text fields, all the kind of form elements, really. Uh, buttons, just a button by itself. Um, and then those atoms get combined together to make molecules. So that, a great example there would be a search field. So, you know, we can style against these things and just style just a search field as opposed to, you know, search fields in the header. So later you're able to basically put the molecule in the organism of the header. So basically logo plus menu plus search bar is your header, really, and each of those are styled individually. So the individual components, atoms, molecules, organisms, they really don't have a set container width. They're really put into other things that set its width for it. And this really helps out with modular design and uh, responsive and mobile. And it's a, it's a big benefit. So um, 
kind of the way that things had been done before really is this linear process, very much waterfall development. I think that this is something that you're pretty all, all pretty familiar with and I think everybody here is trying to get away from this. And the reason I bring it up is really that the issue here is that each step is a blocker and we don't like blockers, right? So we want to be able to make sure that we're not holding up other steps of the process that could be done. Um, you know, I have prototyping in here. Not not everybody gets around to that. Um, some some do, and that that's awesome. But the, the it's it's great that it's even there. But the problem with prototyping here is um, what usually ends up happening is it doesn't really get kept around at all. So a lot of work gets thrown into figuring out a lot of this responsive behavior and how things look in the medium things are destined for, and then it's tossed away because you know it's off to the CMS to actually build the thing that the client paid us to do. Um, so if you're gonna throw it away, why keep it around? Um, it has a ton of benefits though, and so the way that we figured out to keep this benefit around is by just putting it in the Drupal. So we basically just set up our theme like this. So we've just got a folder right next to CSS and JS, Pattern Lab. And it's just a static site generator, and we like git ignore its output. And we basically just uh, link the CSS and the JS to both Drupal and Pattern Lab. So really just in Pattern Lab's header, it's just like the link tag is like dot dot slash dot dot slash up and over and grabs the style sheet. So the thing that, r why this is super helpful is that you know, you can go to your style guide and you can see a list of every form field, uh, select field, all that weird HTML5 text fields like the, the buttons, the secondary buttons, and you just see all those and you just style those. And then the next, then you just go over to the Drupal side and all your forms look good. So you don't have to really like hunt through Drupal and find a page that has the, you know, the form type that you're looking for. Um, so this is, this is really nice. And you can bounce between the two since it's shared. Um, you know, one thing to highlight really is, you know, the generation of the HTML is left to the, the two uh, entities themselves. But CSS and JS is shared. So, and then this, also the pat, uh, Pattern Lab gets deployed to each environment as well. And this is super helpful because then we kind of have a style guide that represents, you know, what it looks like on staging and production and local. So um, that's incredibly helpful. So this kind of leads us to uh, just a parallel iterative process, basically. We can kind of get out of the way of each other and stop blocking each other. So, you know, we've had projects before where instead of having to wait for the entire backend environment to get set up so we have some HTML to even style, we were able to start months ahead and get going. And likewise, on another track, basically, backend is being able to work on a lot of functionality. Um, also, we just kind of have, want to be able to have design in on this process. And it's, you see design up there, and it, that's okay for it to be, it, you know, static comps and assets. Like, nothing's wrong with Photoshop. There's nothing wrong with a comp. The problem is getting 30 comps, like, thrown on you, you know? So the idea is that as new comps are coming out, you can just iterate and, and pull them right into me the medium that they're ultimately destined for. So, well, and this turns around and helps design out as well, because design has a, a, an asset library, basically. You know, they don't have to go hunt into previous PSDs that they made or whatever they're using to be able to find what the header was. This is how we get those like small deviations in margin and padding that are just a time suck for all of us and not what we really want to be doing. So this can help out the designers by providing an asset library. And additionally, backend developers get a huge benefit to this as well because they're able to, it's, it's a great reference, it's a living reference. Uh, so say they need to implement a tab panel, they're able to go to the tab panel component page in Pattern Lab and they just have to really be matching the markup and the classes and you know, it just clicks afterwards because the CSS and JS is shared. So it helps out a lot of people. Um, project managers and stakeholders are, are also on this list. Uh, they kind of have an overview of of basically all the front end components that, you know, where they're at, how far they're along, uh, what everything's looking like, uh, without having to worry about like, say the navigation isn't done in the Drupal site and you can't get to a certain page. Um, if you remember that first slide had a nice drop down menu of all the components. So it's really easy to be able to get around um, 
definitely have seen people from a lot of different roles really appreciate this, pro this process and this approach. You know, it's not just front-end developers being like, yeah, we get to work in a static site generator. Um, although that is really fun. So, um, and there's, lastly as well, there's, uh, there's an objective shared vocabulary. So, I mean, who, who has ever been in like a, a meeting where everybody's kind of, is it the primary button? Is it the main button? Like what really is a media block? So, th the thing that's nice here is that all of those components have a text label. And once you start to have like, some a vocabulary and almost a glossary that you can lean on. Um, it, it helps out to be able to know that people aren't making assumptions of something that is just in people's heads. So um, we'd like to also share how we do things. So uh, phase two's put out our Pattern Lab starter out on GitHub and uh, run these two lines and you'll have a whole setup going just right away. Um, check out the link as well to kind of take a look at our code approach. So this, our Pattern Lab starter is a lot more than just Pattern Lab itself. So we definitely have like Grunt watching and compiling Pattern Lab and SCSS as well. Um, but you have the options to be able to use LibSAS, which is 10 times faster, or Ruby Compass if you'd like to. Uh, auto, air, auto error linting of, the, of just the last file saved for JavaScript, SCSS, and JSON. Um, entire icon system is in there as well, so you can just plop an SVG into a folder and it turns it into um, font icons and then it adds the mixin based on the file name to your SCSS. It creates an HTML class uh, to be used, again, based on the file name, and then it adds it to the Pattern Lab page uh, that lists all the icons. So by dropping an SVG in there, you've updated your style guide. Um, super helpful. Uh, we've kind of taken that approach with a few other things as well because, you know, style guides are only as good as they are up to date and current. So um, the idea is like, so a great example is like the color palette um, that's up there. So what we do here is we just take a look at the SCSS variables you've declared because that's probably the most likely chance you're going to change your color palette and then just create a style guide page from your colors. Uh, we do the same thing, font families, typography sizes, uh, breakpoints. It's actually pretty easy to be able to add some more for your specific project. Um, and then uh, lastly, we've got Bower in there as well. So if there's any kind of external libraries you need, just Bower install the thing, and then it gets the link tags or script tags get added to Pattern Lab automatically. So, um, and of course, it's available as a Yeoman generator. So there you go. I hope that uh, it can help some of you guys out. If anybody has you know, a few, few questions, feel free to open up an issue on, on the GitHub uh, page or talk to us right afterwards or ping us on Twitter. We'll have our names at the, at the end there. Um, we've really seen a big, big benefit come from having our prototype live inside our Drupal theme so it doesn't get discarded. Uh, people can kind of pick the, the best job uh, or the best tool for the job, you know, whether they want to be working in Drupal and, or, or Pattern Lab because a lot of the assets are shared there. So if, if, you're, if you're using some Pattern Lab, just plop it in there it's, and link towards the same CSS, big benefits. Um, and uh, if you already have a Drupal theme and you actually just run this Yeoman generator in the Drupal theme, you'll be pretty much be good to go. Maybe a few pathing issues. You know, you got Git anyway, so you can undo it, right? So uh, we hope this helps you out. Um, so now that's kind of the big overview of how we do things. I hope that was helpful. And uh, next up, we got uh, Joey, our incredible designer, talking about that process. Thank you. Yes. All right. So now we start the design phase. We, we sort of take a step over and go backwards a little bit in time here. We're starting off with a blank slate. But I do want to say that, like in the old days of doing things, um, I would rush into, into making comps. And so we'd go out, we'd, we'd probably do like three comps. Um, but the problem here is it would end up being like this, like a Franken comp and some abomination of a design would, would emerge from this where the client was like, I really, I like the header here, I like the, the sidebar. Let's take this and, and put it all together. So fortunately we're not doing that anymore because we're building we're building systems, we're not building like pages anymore. We're not you know, designing the layouts with the, the components in them. Like, we have sites that are being built by content editors that have hundreds of pages and sub-sites and this has to be a robust system that has a consistent uh, design language that kind of ties it all together. So instead of doing this comps, we're gonna replace it with more of an immersive design discovery. So starting off, we really wanna look to pull everything we can to help us with design. Brand guidelines, stakeholder interviews, user interviews, notes, documentation, 
like wireframes scrawled on a napkin, really anything that's gonna be able to give us something valuable um, to, to be able to, to move forward with that design process. We want a complete bird's eye view and just really be as informed as we can. Like our goal is to make our clients successful and so it's really important that uh, we do our due diligence during this stage. With everything that, that we're doing, we're start, starting off uh, on the shoulders of giants. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. So, so many problems have been solved. So instead of trying to, to solve these design goals in the first round of comps, with, which always ends up really just kind of leading to these discussions anyways, why not take a sampling of some of these problems already solved and explore options to apply them to the given goals for the project. So one way to do that is with um, a visual inventory, which is something invented by, by Dan Mall. It's a quick way to get some feedback on design ideas without actually creating anything from scratch. Um, the format that, that you see here, there's a few different screenshots, is to take uh, screenshots of different applications, sites, it could be even like a poster or a magazine, anything that, that conveys like what you're looking to, uh, to relate the goals back and forth. So, and in turn, we're gonna ask maybe a meaningful question that we can sort of derive from that and approach how that could be related back to them in terms of their goals. We can look to address things like concept, tone, color usage, typography, how the narrative reads. There's so much that can be done here. So many problems have been solved. So in this stage of research, we're really spurring these great conversations that are, that are meant to, to gather that, that powerful feedback and, and break it down and, and let that move us on to the next stage. So with all of that, we're really essentially playing like this design discovery battleship where we're, we're knocking out these sections so we can uh, really narrow the visual range in which we want to explore. And this is really a fundamental aspect of design is to work within constraint because we can't really design all of the things. We have to focus and we have to, we have to perfect. So this is an underlying narrative that you're gonna kind of hear throughout our entire talk is that designing within constraint. So it always, people always say that design is, is pretty subjective, but the goal of everything that we're doing here is to, to take those things that are kind of like murky and subjective and, and really like surface these, surface these objective goals and set constraints so we have something that, to sink our teeth into. But as we keep going on with design, we really wanna start strong with multidisciplinary teams working together in parallel. We wanna tear down the silos of a typical design process and we wanna be iterative, we wanna be collaborative and we wanna work in parallel. Iterative, collaborative, working in parallel, you can hear that a lot. This is like really important. These are the, the foundations of what we're doing for a design process. Good ideas don't care who they happen to, right? I mean, okay, so um, some audience participation here. Um, do we have any developers who've um, had to build some sites um, off design work that you've had zero input on, but you know that your views could have helped improve the final product? Could you raise your hand? All right, awesome. Um, how about designers? Any designers that had a vision, but that vision falls short of the implementation because you weren't around during the build or you weren't there for that final design QA? I mean, I'm, I'm in kind of both, both years. So both of these situations are super frustrating, and I've been in both of them. I come from a design and development background, so I have absolute empathy for both sides. As a front-end developer, I've caught design work that's been like thrown over the silo wall and have to address responsive problems uh, and be responsive behavior during the build process. So it's like, how the hell is responsive design considered, like not considered part of a typical design process? Like why are, it baffles me that agencies are still like outputting comps and comps of pages. This is, what is going on here? We, we need to move forward with this. Like the design process should not be completely limited to, to just designers. Like we need to, to, to bring in these different perspectives because the success really of that final product really hinges on all these different varied perspectives. So I think we all agree with that, but we also need to have some kind of an avenue to move forward with that. And that is design thinking. I mean, it's essentially bringing together this hum uh, desired human perspective with what is both economically viable and technologically feasible. So essentially, let people who aren't trained as designers um, use creative approaches to solve design problems or improve in experience. We're also striving to fit within the budget. I know the PMs love that. And consider the technical approach. Gotta give some love to the devs there. To drill down a bit more, we can accomplish this through a collaborative design process. There's so much, so much to talk about. I, we can't even like possibly begin to cover all this in you know, the 10 minutes that I have here. So uh, really look into some of this afterwards. But um, this is not designed by committee. This is 
these are sessions that are, that are neutrally facilitated with these clear exercises in mind that are structured to reach a specific outcome. It's managed discord in the controlled environment because a lot of times you're on a project and this has happened like so many times where you're working on it, like you go in like three or four months and somebody comes in like some stakeholder that you've never even heard of and they're like, stop this process, this is like not exactly what we wanted and now we have to stop it and go back in and refactor. So if we can take that and structure it in a way where we bring in these different perspectives early on and we control it, it's a very like controlled process for an outcome that we're looking for and I think we're closer to, to something that's, that's more workable. It's not, it's not perfect. You know, there's going to be disagreements. We want that, like as Dries was saying in the keynote. But it's, it's better than you know, the alternative, which is kind of, you know, five, four months down the road, they have to completely redo everything. Um, this is an example of something. It's something simple, just uh, like wireframing out the hierarchy of homepage components. Um, and I, this is a lot with co-design, but really working in an environment where we're doing divergent to convergent thinking. We're going to hold off on... Um, and really giving our feedback until like everybody's had a chance to speak. And we take this, we distill it down. Probably a UX designer can take that and, uh, and compile it to the final form of what we're going for. In parallel with this, we're also working on some of the visual design starting to kick off. And really start at ground level, like as far down as you possibly can go. We want to start and get that foundation for our visual language. So we need to have a common thread throughout the entire brand experience, a typography is that vehicle because it's going to help keep us on brand. Um, this is an example of a website called Typecast. It's tools for kind of exploring some of the like typeface pairings. There's a bunch of cool templates you can play with, and this one's like kind of like a like a blog post or something. But it lets you go on there. You don't have to to buy them from here, and you can see what they look like. And I think things like Typekit and Fonts.com are in here. And once you find something that works, you can take that and maybe screenshot it and drop it into like a comp or, or show the client and do, do a bit more research here. But we do want to set the foundations because. Uh, typography is just, it's been around for like, you know, a long time and it's like the basis for, for, for content and getting that out there. So at this point we've also got some great objective design goals in mind that emerged from the great conversation that we had during our design discovery. And one of the core pieces of our process is iteration. We're starting off with baby steps working in the visual range that was defined. So here is where our art direction happens, where we establish not only what the design is going to look like, but how it's going to feel. On the left is an example of a style tile. Anybody heard of style tiles in here? Okay. Um, invented by Samantha Warren. She's a phase two alum. And she says this really, really, I can't even like, she says, style tiles are a design deliverable consistent of fonts, colors, and interface elements that communicate the essence of a visual brand for the web. It's beautiful. It's, it's a great way to kind of kick off that trajectory of iteration. It's a small like artifact, it's lightweight, you can bust one out if you had to do one. I think I heard a story about somebody did one every day for like 30 days or maybe even more than that to try to find you know, where they needed to, to go with that direction. Um, the right is another example of a lightweight, kind of like a comp of a header and uh, more of like a hero area. So this is the, maybe like the next step after you have what your style tile is for your direction. And as we move forward with this, we're really looking to build up our visual language. This is an, an element collage, and these are all tools. Like, it's a toolbox. You can just kind of use them as you wish. Uh, an element collage, and it's like a style tile on steroids. It's very, very much like a mood board. These are also created by Dan Moll, who um, came up with the visual inventory. So what I love about these is you look at it, and you're like, it looks like a poster. It's kind of like widescreen. It, it's completely outside, well, almost completely outside the context of what a website would feel like. So when you look at this, you're not like, this is a website, it's, it's sideways, like you don't scroll sideways. Um, and it, it really hints at like this cohesiveness of what the art direction, what the visual language are. And um, there's some UI elements on there, some of the typography, the color usage, um, it, maybe a hinting of what a header and a, butter co uh, a button could look like that, that, that is butter colored. <laughs> and um, it, it sort of shows up, but it's the next step in the process. It's, it's iterative, it's a throwaway artifact. We're gonna throw it away. I like it, I, um, I had a fun time making it, but. It's, just, it's, it's there to kind of move the process forward. And any time during the process, you can stop and say, hey, you know, let's, let's change out like, the photos. The art director doesn't feel right. We need something maybe like, maybe like black and white, like more contrasty, more drama, more emotion. And you can stop that here, and you can kind of work with that. It's, don't, also, don't be afraid to, to change up your process. If it isn't working, you're in an iterative like, process. You can really like, just turn very quickly. There's, there's not much risk in that. And um, that's really the beauty of that, of this process. 
So at that point, like, you could choose to go into the browser I have at certain points, or you could continue to keep going. Um, this is just a, a screenshot that I have of some elements that I worked on in Sketch. And um, at this point, we're really working with the outcome of the UX work, which has been focusing on component-driven uh, design. And we're, we're taking some of that work, marrying some of the, like, the, the visual language with, with that, and sort of massaging it and looking at things. So as, as I'm designing this, I can add pieces to it. I can look at one thing and sort of like this atomic design methodology is starting to kind of emerge from this, where I can say, all right, I got a button here. I'm going to grab that. Let's put that over there. This one doesn't feel right. Maybe go back and revisit it and kind of work with that. And this is really where like, we see a hint of what a design system, like what, what it's looking like. It's starting to come to life. And this is really just another step. We're moving forward, we're moving forward. At any point, we can stop. There's no big reveal. It's just kind of iterative. So process recap. Parallel work. We want to be starting in parallel with multidisciplinary teams. We've got like IA and UX. We could do like user testing, like so much there. Um, art direction, visual, visual language. We could be setting up like backend and architectures, like so much stuff. We want to start strong. We want to start in parallel. We want to iterate. We want to continue to refine that. We get feedback, design, feedback. We, we, we loop through this over and over again. We also want to collaborate because like, we, we really we have like, good ideas. We have perspectives. It's valuable. Like, you're, you're, we're there for a reason like, for what we're doing on our projects, and we want to like, pull all of those in. Like, the design process should not be locked out to that. We want to like, get those perspectives. It's very important. Designer takeaways. You have to learn enough CSS and HTML to prototype your design work. This is like, totally key. You don't have to write production quality. I mean, you, you can. We, we try to strive for that, but that's not really like, what you're going for. Um, the really important thing is you want to control the design process like, as much as you can, which includes responsive behavior. Like, you can't just like, make all these comps, like desktop and, and medium screen and, and tablet, or, or, I mean, and, and mobile, because it's, there's so much that happens inside there. It's so organic. Without like, actually designing all of that together, you're just like, completely missing the mark, and you're like, dropping like, essentially your job in somebody else's lap, and the front-end developer ends up doing your design work in the, during the build of the process. And it's just so insanely frustrating to me, and I vowed that I would never make a developer have to, to do that again. So um, yeah, and it's still OK to use Photoshop. It's still OK to use InDesign or whatever else, you know, Microsoft Paint. Um, these, these are artifacts that are meant to inform the prototype. They're meant to inform uh, the design system. Um, be available throughout the entire project. And I know that as a designer, we, it's not always up to us. It's up to maybe the engagement design or up to project managers. But um, this is something that is really important. We, we can start off strong on the project, but we need to be there to come in and to hit things that pop up. We need to be there, especially at the end, to ensure this excellence through design QA. Like getting in there, and this is where getting your hands dirty with some HTML and CSS is good because you know, launches are, are tight and this, things are moving very quickly. So as a designer, if we can get in there, pull down a Git repo, just do some quick like CSS adjustments to move things to where they need to be so we can sleep at night, then you know, that's, like, that's what has to happen to make these projects a full success. So back to the iterative design process. We've been building the visual language and kind of establishing it and building it up and starting to see what a design system looks like. So the next step at this point is to get to the browser. <laughs> and with that, I'll, I'll pass the mic to Michael Godbolt, who's going to talk about design systems and front-end architecture. Thank you, Joey. And he, he read that slide completely wrong. <clears throat> get to the browser. That's how you're supposed to read the slide. Awesome. So thanks, Joey. So <clears throat> what he's done is he's talked to us about how we get to this point of developing <laughs> developing our visual language um, about the, the visual appearance of the site, the colors, the buttons, the fonts, how, how we're basically going to be speaking what we need to speak to the users of our website. And for us, this visual language is really, it really is a language. Um, and the point of this language is to be able to speak these things to people. So what we need to be able to do is figure out how to turn that language into a design system. And um, well, apparently I need to click. And that's why we need to talk to you about the idea of breaking this thing down into a design system. See, as a design system is a programmatic representation of our visual language inside of code. Now, just like a spoken language can be broken down into nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, our job is to deconstruct this visual language so we can reconstruct it, put it back together again, and create the rules that define how that language is put together. 
It's by breaking down the visual language um, into its smallest pieces that we learn how to put it back together. Um, put it back together into various sentences, paragraphs, chapters, novels, our entire website. Now, the goal of this conversion, don't right click, there we go. The goal of this conversion is to create a scalable and maintainable code base that faithfully reproduces anything that this language is capable of expressing. This conversion of visual language to design system is a collaborative job between the designer and the front end developers and anyone else with a stake in this. And it's also one of the outcomes of what I like to call front end architecture. Front end architecture, um, oh, actually, next slide. That's the definition. Front end architecture is a collection of tools and processes early in the development life cycle meant to improve the quality of our front end code while creating a more sustainable and um, I totally missed that one. Sustainable and efficient workflow. Thank you. So many of these tools inside of front-end architecture are things that we already use. They're not new. Many of the processes are already tried and true processes. But the point is we're putting them to get together in a very intentional way. And the way we put these together is the banner under which we create this design system. So let me walk you through the four pillars and talk to you about how these four pillars um, affect this design system and this project as we move forward with it. Pillar one is our code, the actual code that we write, the assets that we create for our project. Now, who here follows the Drupal code standards when you write your PHP? Yes? Awesome? Cool. I was hoping for some hands. That makes it a lot easier. So how many people, maybe the front-end developers that don't write as much PHP, have had your merge request rejected because you had an extra space after your code block or something like that? Yes, only me, a couple, all right. This happens, because there's these great tools that can go through and lint all the PHP you're writing and tell you you're not writing your documentation properly. Wow, that's, that's extremely granular control over the PHP code that's acceptable into the system. Now, how many people are doing the exact same thing for your HTML and your CSS? I see a hand, and I love some of you, awesome. There are some great tools out there, um, but not only just like, are your properties in the right order, but are your properties applied to the right things? Now, we're not designing pages anymore. We've kind of talked about that several times. So we need, to, we need to establish a process and approach for breaking all these things into smaller pieces. Uh, we need to create small modular pieces, and we need to figure out the best way to do that. It might be atomic design, which is the way we've been talking about. It might be OOCSS. It might be snacks. It might be whatever process, whatever approach works best for the content that you have. Uh, and the project I'm at right, at right now with redhat.com, we have a very different approach because our content is laid out very differently. So we have an approach that works specifically for our content. It might not work in other contexts, but for us it works perfectly. So then once we have an approach for breaking things up into pieces, we need to figure out what's the best way to apply that visual language to all of those pieces. This is our design system. And this is going to dictate what is acceptable and what is not acceptable CSS. Now, for us on redhat.com, we've got a list of rules that we like to call the Roadrunner rules. Now, you might have seen this around recently. This is a list of nine rules put up by Chuck Jones about the universe of the Roadrunner cartoons. There are things that state like, the Roadrunner cannot harm the coyote, except by going beep beep. There's no dialogue ever except, you guessed it, beep beep. The roadrunner must stay on the road. Otherwise, he wouldn't be called a roadrunner. He'd just be called a runner, right? So these are the rules in which the authors, the writers of Roadrunner cartoon, and the animators of the cartoon have to abide under. Anything outside of these rules will be rejected and not published. This is the same type of approach that we take, and then we have a set of rules that govern what can and cannot happen with the code that we introduce into our system. For example, we break things up into layouts versus components, and they each have very specific roles. A layout, for example, is specifically built to provide a background, to provide theme context, as well as, as layout for the child elements inside of it. Now, the components, they don't care about their background. They don't care about margins. They don't care about padding around them. The only thing they care about is styling the elements that are inside of the component. And it's this separation 
And this knowledge, the, the fact that everyone knows these rules and knows that the code will be judged upon these rules when they get a merge request, that allow us to create a predictable, a testable, and a scalable design system. Pillar two is testing. So we do Drupal. Drupal loves behavioral testing because we have lots of processes. Who here does behavioral testing? Like BHAT, those kind of things, cool, all right. Unit testing, we use some unit testing in our PHP. We got some, cool, unit testing's great. You can do that with JavaScript and other things as well. What about visual regression testing? You getting into that? Yes, got a couple, awesome. What's that? Oh, um, I swear. Oh, I got back one. Thank you guys. Cool, all right, that makes a lot more sense, testing. All right, now how many people are testing their site performance? Some great tools out there, some grunt tools, some web-based tools. It's amazing if you, have, um, if you have a process set up where your site performance is tested on every single merge request so that you can catch those problems when they happen. And that is the point of the testing pillar. See, testing shouldn't be an afterthought. It's not a nice to have. Testing is checking the foundation of our building before we build another story on top of it. And that's not something that's optional. Testing allows us to know that that foundation is set and is settled and that nothing we do up here is going to, uh, to invalidate it. The purpose of testing is to mitigate the negative impacts of any introduced code. So whether those regressions are functionality, user experience, visual appearance, browser performance, the mission of testing is to catch that infectious code before it's ever merged in from our feature branches. So even before it gets in the master, those things are caught. And it's by setting the expectations of how the system should work, making those expectations measurable by any developer and at any time, we ensure that no developer is surprised by the code that they introduce. <clears throat> I run a little script and PHP yells at me because I did something wrong. I know that there's something wrong before I ever introduce that code back in as a merge request. And we make sure that any code introduced actually has a positive impact on the system versus a negative. All right, cool. We've moved forward, excellent. All right, so uh, we've talked about this a bit. Who uses Grunt, Gulp, some kind of process or task runner? Awesome, it's very cool. Now, that's not the only thing. Um, a really good question, obviously don't, don't want you to blurt all this out because it'll get really loud. Think about how long does it take for you to set up a new developer on a new laptop? Is it half hour? That'd be nice. Is it two hours? Is it a day? Is it two weeks? How long, somebody walks in the door, new employee, new laptop, does it take before they are writing validated code to enter into the system? That is the process. That is the value of creating the process. So that, ooh, I dropped my laptop in the water and it's gonna take me two weeks to get back up and running. It's a lot of lost time. So the process pillar describes the steps required and the tools used to add new functionality to the design system. Now, it's not just about tools, but also how and when we use these tools. It's about putting the UX in the proper place in the development life cycle. It's not putting UX after Drupal development, where you're stuck with whatever markup the Drupal developers decided you should have. It's putting that in front. It's doing that UX work before any PHP is even written so that you can get client feedback, so you can do cross-browser testing, so you can actually get a sign-off on the functionality and the visual appearance of what you're building before a single, write of, a single line of PHP and a single developer hour is spent. So at that point, the developer knows what their target goal is. <clears throat> that target goal has been vetted by everyone that has a chance to look at it. <clears throat> and QA knows when it's done. They can verify that what's been built is exactly what was signed off on. That is process, and that is putting a process in place for your project to win. The palest ink is better than the best memory. And it's very true. As we try to write this talk, and I've got these great ideas while I'm in the shower, like, yes, this is perfect, it's perfect, and you sit down to write, and you forget what you're thinking. So even if it's the palest ink, it's so much better than what sticks in our brain. So documentation is obviously incredibly important. As we build our system and we pour our individual expertise and knowledge in every atom, every molecule, every organism, in short, we are the experts of the system. We are proud of the incredible work that we have done, 
But it's not just about us and what we know about the system. There's others that'll be using this system. We're not building a system just for us. We're building a system for our team so our team can succeed. And we're not always going to be on this project. We might be finishing up with the contract and handing it over. We might be, hey, promoted if it goes really well. It's not always going to be us working on this project. And those are just a few of the many reasons why documentation is so important. Documentation at its root is really a content strategy problem. We've got so many things that we need to say about the process and the tools and the things that we do. And we have so many audiences that need to read and learn about what these things are. See, we document our board onboarding process, the way we write our HTML, the naming conventions of our classes, the expectations of accessibility and progressive enhancement. Eventually, we need to get to a point where we document how we document. A fully documented system is a web property all of its own. It's got its own navigation, its own taxonomy, its own search and typographical style. As soon as you're creating a style guide to mock up how your style guide is going to be looking, you know you've reached the Zen level mastery of style guide and documentation. So documentation is all about capturing all that knowledge that eventually ends up in these personal silos. So create a plan for documentation. This isn't something you do at the end of a project. You need to work in time for every single feature that you, you build to write the, that documentation. So if you've got a story and it's got task, 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 and one of those tasks is not writing the documentation, something is wrong. Because you need to have hours for that. You need to have time for that so that it can be properly documented. Yeah, fix. All right. Leonardo da Vinci once said, a website is never finished. It is only abandoned. Now, it's true that our work is really never done. There's always going to be something else that we need to do. But there's one magical yet mythical point where our design system is capable of expressing or of, capable of creating everything that our visual language is capable of expressing. Now, think about this utopia for a little bit. You walk into work on Monday, and you're handed this task to go and create a new node type, new content type. So instead of going and creating a whole bunch of new CSS, a whole bunch more JavaScript to build this big, huge page out, instead you crack open Pattern Lab, you build up a new page, you pull together all of your existing atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, pull all these together and create everything required for this node page to be able to be represented. We have a design system capable of representing everything this visual language can do. So in the end, your work's already done. Your design, language, your, your design system can already do everything that language needs. You can build out that entire page without writing a single line of code, without adding a single line of bloat to your site. That is a mythical point that we all strive for, and of course it never lasts. Because eventually, someone needs a new feature. Someone needs that carousel that everyone loves. Someone needs something. And it's, it's fine. We add new vocabulary to the language all the time. English is a great language. It's got lots of ways to express the things that you want to say. But eventually, someone has to say twerking. And as horrible as it is, it's got to go in the dictionary. So we do it. I, I've debated on saying that word. I, is that even real offensive? Anyway, moving on. All right. So <laughs> when, it time, when it comes time to introduce that new vocabulary, see, the thing is, we, we already have a system in place. We already know our code standards about how we're going to write that into our design system. We already have regression testing to know that the changes that we, that we make to introduce this new language isn't going to break anything. We've got documentation set up already so that we can just add new documentation for how this new language should work. And we have a workflow that makes this process efficient and defect-free. In the end, we have a new design workflow. Thank you. Next slide. And does anyone have any questions? What time is it? Do we have a bunch of time? Awesome. There's, oh, wow. a, there's a mic in the middle here, so please. Go ahead, and if you have a question, oh, right. you can Sorry, line up Sorry. in the middle there. Yep, you microphone over there. First come, first serve. Run, run, run. You're the leaving the room. You can't leave until you have actually a question. Just kidding. <laughs> Everyone who leaves uh, has a question. No. 
Otherwise, we'll shout dancing. I, I think he's worked up a jig of some sort. Right. Mr. Oh, Potter. Okay, no dancing. <laughs> Mr. Potter. <laughs> no, no dancing for me. Um, so uh, that's like that's like the pinnacle of design right, or workflow right there, where you just build everything statically and magically port everything to Drupal. Is there ever a point where you need to get something from Drupal back into Pattern Lab, let's say, or copy and paste? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I'll so take, yeah. So, I mean, it, it you know it depends on the, how much time you've got. So, if you basically just need to kind of hurry up, there's no problem with really just going over to Drupal, inspect element, right click on it, copy, pull it over to Pattern Lab, paste it in there, and start working on it. Um, obviously, if you have a little bit of more time and it's a more complicated thing, you can see that there's already kind of some subcomponents in there. Those can be broken out pretty easily. Um, so that works out pretty good for, for us. So yep. don't ever good. hesitate to do that. <laughs> Always take the simplest path. Thanks for sharing. Um, in all of this process, in the design and, and bringing, back, bringing those things together, is there a moment where maybe uh, for I can understand in like larger sites it becomes really daunting, but involving the content strategy team and kind of figuring out things like lengths and is there something in the documentation that incorporates that or is there some thinking you've done about this problem? Because we've had that at times where we're like developing a thing, we've got the style guide, we've got the prototype, we're working, but involving the content management team, uh, the, the sort of more content strategy side of things, figuring out voice and like being able to f show the client some of the work ongoing, have an idea of how the content fits into all of this. Uh, it's sort of like, seems like the next big step in all of this, and I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts about yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, one thing great about documentation is it is what you make it. I mean, just like Drupal is a platform you build a website on top of. I mean, documentation, there's, there's no one way to do documentation. Um, <clears throat> we use a system called uh, Hologram that allows us to write... Um, write our documentation right inside of all the rest of our files, right inside of basically mark down inside of some comments. And really what that allows us to do is create anything that we need to create. Um, so we have documentation on, um, on our fonts and on the different colors and how you create new Git tags and how you push up releases. And we, we can document all of our process, but we can also document other parts of it. Uh, you can document, you know, what's an acceptable photo? What, what is good copy? You know, what, what are our copy links? Like, you know, a long and a medium and a short copy links. We can get all that into documentation because we have this whole idea of we've got navigation, that we can have different sections. We have taxonomies for our different pages. We have search. So you can go in and search for the different topics that someone needs to hear about. And, and the point of this documentation style guide is it's always accessible to, to anyone that needs to get to it. So your audience, we find that our audience is, is, is there's not just developers, it's not just front end, not just back end, but it's also uh, the business owners and the product owners and the content creation team that they can all go in there and have one place to find that information. So whether you need to mock something up with some fake content to show like, you know, what our, 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 vo our, 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 you know, our vocal style is, whatever that word is, um, to tone, oh. vocal tone, no, anyway. Um, you, can, you can actually put examples in your style guide that demonstrates those. So uh, make the documentation what you need to be to demonstrate everything about your, your website. Can you talk a little bit about, um, <clears throat> you had mentioned in the beginning, it sounded like you pulled some CSS down from Pattern Lab and dropped that directly into the Drupal theme. Can you talk a little bit about that and what uh, Pattern Lab outputs and how you pull that in and how you use that? Sure thing. So. Um, you know, just, just like in your theme, you know, you declare like CSS slash style dot CSS, right? So, uh, and Pattern Lab is just a static site generator. So, you know, right in the theme folder, we have Pattern Lab, and then there's two subfolders in there, source and public. So, um, what happens when you compile Pattern Lab is it throws them all in, in public, and that's just straight static HTML. Um, and then in the source, you know, there's like a partial for the header. And basically, up in there, you know, there's just a link tag, and it's dot dot slash times four specifically, and then slash CSS slash style dot CSS. So it's just a relative link that goes up there and just points towards the exact same CSS that uh, that Drupal's looking at. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, 
And the question was, how do we yeah. how do we communicate responsive design, complex responsive design, to our developers? I think the answer to that is kind of in part of designers be needing to be able to actually prototype out some of the responsive behavior themselves, and also kind of meeting halfway, uh, working very closely with the front end developer. Um, just a lot of communication, a lot of working together, sort of like working as one brain to to design that. And I think um, it can be conveyed through through artifacts that they need to to do some of that. I think really also thinking about this in terms of component based design where we're looking at like those individual pieces of how they respond sort of um, not caring about the context of, of what they're sitting in um, then you can look at that and tackle those problems more individually so I, I, I just the answer to that really is that you need to have the designer and the front end developer just really working closely together and just having constant communication and I think the, a lot of the process like I can't prescribe something it's really going to come down to how they work together and um, and really just having that communication is going to kind of um, the, a process will emerge from that. It, does that answer the question? Or? Yeah. Well, Pattern Lab is, I mean, for what we're looking at, is really the tool, yeah, that we that we're using for that, um, and just having like that shared vocabulary, vocabulary with um, the atomic design methodology, with the atoms and the. Or, uh, organisms and molecules and, and things like that. We're able to, to look at that. So um, designers um, work inside Pattern Lab to, to maybe rough something out. Um, a front end developer can come in and really start to to make that to make that more production quality and work together on that. So working inside that, and it doesn't have to be. I mean, Pattern Lab is a tool. We, we really prefer to talk more about um, like the methodology, but that I mean, we're really using that for so many projects, and it's a common vehicle. We're even starting to do. Uh, more of the workflows for for our UX, and um, we can do like work in there with content design and, and get uh, work through IA. And so it's really it's a great tool to be able to have multidisciplinary teams working in there and kind of different pieces. And one other thing to note is Holog or okay, I'm sorry, uh, Pattern Lab isn't just the small pieces. You also have the ability to create um, templates and also pages. So you can mock up entire pages in Pattern Lab. It's not just the tiny pieces. So it gives you the opportunity to say, like, what is this complex responsive layout actually going to look like in the browser using all the pieces that are built in Pattern Lab. So it gives you that flexibility to pretty much build out your entire site within Pattern Lab if you wanted to. Yeah. So um, whenever you're building in Pattern Lab, you build these components. Have you ever um, played with adding uh, element queries to these components? like? And do you yes. have any libraries that you use? Are you, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So would love, would eagerly, eagerly love some native support on that. But uh, I, on a previous project, we've just used some JS libraries that hook onto data attributes. Um, and I mean, you, you, you nailed it right there because it's pretty tough to be able to write modular code. You know, you're, you're thinking about just this block, but you have to write a media query based on the width of the page. So therefore, we've you know, kind of contradicted ourselves. Like now, suddenly, this like little component is aware of the con of its context, and that's against the rules. So those are the rules. Um, <laughs> but so element queries would just be like totally nail it. Um, so that'd be really nice. Uh, so I get it's it's kind of a combination of both. Is like yeah, sometimes uh, some just classic media queries just kind of get written in there. You know, because we kind of know where it's going to be, and there's going to be you know some tweaking. That's why iteration is super important. Um, but there's also some JS libraries uh, for uh, pulling in some element queries. So that would be that'd be a good tool to be able to use. Yes. It's we're using it in production. It's used in production. Yeah. yeah. There's there's uh there's big sites that I cannot name, I'm sorry, but <laughs> um but that are that I, are I've, seen, I've seen large news organizations. I don't know yeah. if it was like, like it's enterprise. So yeah, it's very it's much there. enterprise tested. Yeah. yeah. Um the one that by Sam Richard, I know he's done it to like if you had ten thousand instances on a page of it, it'd be like this tiny minor uh, performance hit. And typically you do maybe a couple dozen at the most. So, you know, as long as you're smart about it. And really, like, we started introducing them, and we found out we really didn't use a ton because we, we didn't have a lot of need to, like, change layout of stuff because stuff was usually pretty much a stack. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a great tool to have in your, in your basket when you need it, uh, yeah. and it changes a lot. I would definitely say use a standard media query first if that does the trick. Yeah, well, if you know the thing's going to always be 100% wet. Any other questions? Song requests? No. <laughs> awesome. All well, right. yeah, I don't yeah, know. We'll, I, think we'll, the, I think it went off. And we'll be at the Facey booth. Um, we'll be hanging out there if you guys do want to come by and 
just talk or ask any questions Perfect. or whatever. So, thank yep. you. Thank you.